Hello there, this is Dr. Jimmy again. And again, for those of you who have some sort of bizarre interest in what I'm wearing, thinking my shirts mean something, well, how's this then? Keep calm, I'm the doctor. <laughs> Appropriate enough, I suppose. There we go. So, this is my sixth video in my series on the history of Halloween Horror Nights 21. In my previous video, I'd begun talking about Winter's Night, The Haunting of Hawthorne Cemetery, which was the third house in Sound Stages that year. In fact, it was in Sound Stage 22, not Sound Stage 23. It was not sharing a Sound Stage with anybody. It was all by itself in Sound Stage 22, which was cracked up really cold, as I mentioned. Uh, I talked about the very beginning of the, of the house where you encounter the Weeping Angels, of course. After that, you continue through the marvellous Hawthorne Cemetery. Remarkable. You saw huge mausoleums and crypts and catacombs, and you also encountered scenes of the cemetery itself going out into the hills through miniature diorama. Quite remarkable. Very beautiful. And... <coughs> pardon me. In some ways, this house reminded me of uh, the Haunted Mansion at Disney World, uh, and also in California. There's a, there's a, the original Haunted Mansion is there, of course. Not, not the house so much, not the uh, attraction itself, but the queue area, this, the newer queue area they have at, at Walt Disney World, uh, where you have all those various crypts and monuments and graves with humorous writing on it, and uh, you travel around through all of those before you get into the house itself. There's also a cemetery scene in the house, uh, and, and, it, and some of that, all sorts of crazy things happening in the cemetery. And this kind of reminded me of that, and a lot of the, uh, the architecture and the, and the aesthetic was similar, except, of course, it's not funny. You know, the, the haunted mansion over at Disney is, is humorous, or this, of course, is scary. And, uh, and, uh, but there were a few jokes, nonetheless, which we'll get to. But it was very beautiful, and you go through all sorts of places, and the revenants, the dead, are, are there, of course, popping out of tombs, popping out of coffins. You're never quite sure where they're going to come from. There's some remarkable effects in here. They had it set up, so you're walking along past this area, and there's like an open grave near you, and coming out of the grave is this horrible corpse, and he's like up to his... And then they set it up so it's like at uh, waist level. So there's the grave, it's like up here. And that way he, the character is actually climbing out. He's actually walking, but it looks like he's climbing out of a grave, coming up right toward you. Very nifty. Uh, and there's lots of coffins where dead bodies in them are falling out that have because it's old and dilapidated. And sometimes they're above you, and sometimes they're below you. There's a neat distraction scare in one scene because there was like a hole in the ground, or actually a hole in the wall, and you could look down, it looked like it went down forever with a mirror effect, and there might have been some sort of ghost or body down there that was moving, or a projection, a mirror effect, a, a part of this ghost, and you're very interested in what you're seeing down below, and while you're looking down below, you don't realize the coffin that's hanging out of one of those niches above you has a, a, a character in there, and comes reaching down after you, oh my god, you're getting uh, above and below, distracted trick, very nifty. At one point, you go through a little caretaker's cottage, a uh, little caretaker's uh, shack, and uh, blue lights are everywhere, all those lanterns, of course, and, and, and it may even be the shack of Turnbull, the mysterious alchemist. We don't know, but there's, there's food in there and supplies and things for someone living in a little bed, and, of course, somebody comes lurching out at you in there as well. It's very remarkably, very well done scares, very nifty. And you go through, in some scenes, you're actually more like catacombs. It's reminiscent of a catacomb house from the year before, with all sorts of stuff and structures made out of bits of bone and skulls into the walls and in the ceiling, a great chandelier of bone bits and pieces hanging above you. And this also used a nifty scare. Remember back in Chucky in 2009, they had a... Uh, a scare actor who was made out of little plush animals, and so you thought a pile of plush animals in the corner suddenly gets up, right? They do something similar. There's a pile of bones in the corner in the catacomb. A pile of bones, all just bones and skulls and bits and pieces, femurs and, and, uh, and, and sacrilegious and all sorts of bits and rib cages, all that, spines, all of that. It's sort of lying there, a pile of bones, but you don't realise it's a scare actor, and it gets up and comes after you as well. Quite fun. Marvellous. Now, you know, 
as I said, there was a remarkable panorama, a sort of diorama, really, a diorama. You're walking along, and there's a wall, and it has windows, okay, in, in the, in the uh, mausoleum, and there are windows on one side, and you look out the windows, and you see the whole vast cemetery going off, way off into the distance. It's all done upon a hilltop, and there's all the graves from the ones right near you, which are big, huge gravestones, all the way to the graves, way and far away, must be, you know, maybe a half a mile off. But of course, those are only about this big because it's miniature, it's a you know, forced perspective. But it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And there's a, a hearse out there, and, and a procession of strange characters in black hoods and cloaks like like apparitions of death itself perhaps or maybe the iniquitous from next year who knows <laughs> but we didn't know that then there's these these strange reaper like characters out there in procession the mourners perhaps whatever they're out there by this by this burial out there happening out there in the cemetery and of course you're really fascinated and you want to see that and you're looking through the windows and of course there's a character on the other side of the wall Rah! comes through the window at you when you're looking out at the cemetery very beautiful beautiful house and chilling cold and and as I said, there were inside jokes. As you go through the various tombs and areas, you see monuments on the wall, of course. It is when you have uh, those, those shelves that you put body uh, caskets into and, and then put a plaque over it on the side of a wall. So you can have like a family crypt with all of these, uh, all of these uh, monuments. And, if you, and similar also, I mentioned the Haunted Mansion. They have a similar setup. It's Black Bluebeard, Bluebeard and his wives. Well, here we see one like that, and it's like, all of this, and you read, and uh, the surname seems oddly familiar. That is Brady, B R A D I E, or something like that. But the first names are this Michael and Caroline. Those are the the the, the family and, and their children. There's a Gregory and Peter and Robert, and over here we have uh, uh, Marcia and uh, and Janet and. Uh, and Cynthia, oh my God, it's the Brady Bunch. And in the very middle is Ann B. Davis, or somebody, or Alice, or somebody. So it's quite amusing. It was a Brady Bunch family mausoleum inside the house. A, a little bit of inside joke. If you read the names, you get that. Oh, ha. And they also did inside jokes by putting up tombs and memorials and, and plots and mausoleums. There's the Grummel family and the Hughes family and the Aiello family, all people involved in creative and A&D. And then, of course, another little cameo grave near the end, great big tombstone that says Mary Shaw, of course. It's the same grave they had in the cemetery scene at the very beginning of Dead Silence back in 2007. They kept that prop and they put it up here. And indeed, they do recycle props sometimes. In fact, almost all of these graves and monuments would show up in all the cemetery scenes in the streets of 2012. So, see, Universal is green. <laughs> and so after that, the very end of the, of the thing, after you go through travel and all the various ghosts and, and undead creatures that you encounter in the cemetery, at the very end, of course, you find the same hooded figures that you saw out in the cemetery but now they're right up by you and there's several of them standing on either side by a hearse and some graves as you go for the exit gates and they're all and you don't know they're all very still some of them of course are static mannequin figures but some of them are scare actors the trouble is don't know which is which and next thing you know argh, a horrible skeletal face creature like some sort of undead crone comes after you one of them was my friend Kim who had, of course, played uh, uh, Sylvia Ganush uh, back in 2009 in the uh, Horrorwood Scare Zone, and had also, the year before that, in 2010, had, had been uh, w w the, uh, the storyteller in the Fear Revealed Scare Zone. So now she was in a house. That was nice. Good for her to get out of the, get out of the weather for once. So, even though it was cold in there. So that was the house, the haunting of Hawthorne Cemetery. Delightful. Now, I had mentioned, I'd mentioned before that uh, back in 2011 I had begun uh, a sort of project where I would uh, where I would start making cocktails for the uh, for the haunted houses. That was the first year I did that, theming them. And I have my iPhone with me, so I can actually show you now. This is the cocktail, if you can see it. That was the Thing cocktail. I don't know how well you can see that. It should be green. 
uh, looks kind of white, maybe because it's so bright in here. Maybe if I shade it a little, you can see the green colour. I don't know how to do that. But anyway, it was it, it was made with Midori and Sprite and a, a citrus vodka. And uh, this is the, the Nightingale's Cocktail, which was made... Oh, something happened. Uh, there I go. The Nightingale's Cocktail that was made uh, with, uh, if you recall, uh, gin and vermouth and Jägermeister. Right, so for this one, it was a very simple cocktail. It was actually the first one I came up with. As you see, it's all bright blue, matching the color of the blue. Oh, turn it that way, you can see it better. Ah, that's a good idea. Matching the, uh, see, so there was, uh, yeah, now I can show you that one better by turning it sideways. That way you can see the color, the green for the thing. So here it is. This was uh, made with, uh, with uh, blue curacao. Uh, that's why it's got the blue color to match the color of the blue light and to make it chilling and curled, I had mixed it with rumple mints, which of course has a peppermint schnapps to give it that frosty, frosty curd feeling. Of course, it's on ice anyway. And uh, Sprite, so it's just simple ingredients, but it had that chilling uh, coldness and also uh, had uh, the color to match the blue light. So that was the cocktail for that house. So now let's move on to the fourth house. And this was located in disaster overflow Q area, <clears throat> which was still being used back then, uh, not like now when it's gone, but back then it was still a, a traditional place for haunted houses every year, and uh, that one was a very interesting house called H.R. Blood and Guts, presents Holidays of Horror, a very festive house covering the whole calendar in, in horror, and uh, for well, that one, I need to tell, for some of you who are quite young, I'm assuming, and maybe don't know much about the whole concept of the horror host. And it's interesting, that whole concept, that idea of having a host for horror movies, for television, has its roots at Universal Studios itself, yes. If you, if you might recall, and you should, back in the 1930s and 40s, there were some marvellous films created by Universal that started all of this. The, Dracula, Frankenstein, uh, The Bride of Frankenstein, The Mummy, The Wolfman, The Creature from the Black Lagoon, that was in the 50s, a little bit later, but we also had, uh, uh, what was it, um, The Invisible Man, I mentioned that, I think, and, uh, and uh, uh, even in the 20s, there was The Phantom of the Opera and, and The Hunchback of Notre Dame, all of these great old films uh, that they did. Of course, they started doing sequels, Daughter of Dracula, uh, Son of Frankenstein, Son of Dracula, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, House of Dracula, House of Frankenstein, and eventually sort of disintegrated into pure camp with Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, all of that. <coughs> but, see, people saw these films then in the 30s and 40s in the cinemas, but then later in the 1950s, uh, there was a whole generation that hadn't seen these films back when they'd been in cinema. Some, some of them, you know, 30 years before, 20, 30 years, 10, 20, 30 years earlier, they hadn't seen these films, but they'd heard about them, of course, and, they'd, and, and Hammer films began making uh, new versions in colour to be in cinemas in England, late 50s. But then something happened. There's this thing started showing up in people's houses. It's a sort of box, you know, it was very new and exciting back then. Uh, a little box that could sit in your living room. It was a little box, you know, maybe sometimes only about, yeah, big, sometimes only maybe a little bit bigger, with a tiny, you know, 11 inch screen, black and white only, and uh, started out only live television. Uh, and eventually this novelty became uh, in everyone's houses and soon everybody had a television set and and you would watch things like wrestling that was mainly what was on when it first became new and, and occasionally some variety programming some comedy shows Milton Burrow of course wearing a dress usually being funny and then eventually some situation comedies and and uh, various programs and some smart people like Alfred Hitchcock and Walt Disney realized that they could they could make their own uh, that it wasn't the enemy of the movies you could actually promote your cinematic projects and do your own television programs so that was quite a nifty uh, transition but what happened then is that the people at Universal thought well here's a vehicle by which we can stir up interest in our old movies and they sent out a package for 
uh, what was called syndication, and so it wasn't connected to any one network, but the syndicate would, uh, would, would sell these packages to individual TV stations around the country that weren't necessarily affiliated with one of the networks, like ABC, NBC, CBS, or any of those. Uh, instead, they would be able to pick up these packages, and there were packages of universal horror films, you know, the classic old films from way back in the 30s and 40s, and they could show them on their televisions late at night, and then all these new kids who had not seen them before could see them, and oh my God, and thus a whole new generation of monster kids arose. And in the 60s, they, they started, you know, following Forrest J. Ackerman's famous monsters of film lands and building Aurora model kits, and, and the monsters came, and all, all of that sort of stuff. So monsters were popularized, uh, in perpetuity through the medium of television. But many of these little stations decided to do something to promote this shock theater, it was called, shock theater, and they, they, had, uh, they hired some fellow, or in some cases a, a nice lady, to stand up before the cameras, and, because you see you have commercial interruptions. These movies weren't made for that, and so you'd have to edit the movie so there'd be breaks and you have a commercial. When you did that, instead of just going from movie to commercial, they thought wouldn't be neat if there were like little film vignettes. So the movie would start, of course, and it was hosted by this person who would often be dressed as a vampire and, or and some mad scientist in a set they would create on the TV station that looked like some sort of dungeon. And, Hello and welcome to Shock Theatre. And then he would say what movie was going to tonight we're showing The Wolfman or whatever. And they would make some jokes and then in the breaks in between he'd show up again and make jokes about the movie. Oh, he's a hairy brute, isn't he? He should shave. Isn't it funny that he was wearing, you know, one of those sleeveless T-shirts and when he transformed and then when he's a werewolf he's all dressed in black long sleeve shirt. How did that happen? When did he change his clothes? After he turned into a werewolf? That makes no no bloody sense. You know, maybe pointing out these little flaws in the movie, that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, there were some very prominent horror hosts, especially Zachary in New York, and there was Sven Gulli and Goulardi, and then over in California, Van Byra with a slinky black dress, kind of sexy, and a whole bunch of young men would watch that for reasons not just because they like horror movies, but because, wow, she's hot. And that sort of thing. And so there were all sorts of horror hosts, and it became quite a big thing going into the 60s and even into the 1970s. But eventually, as home video comes along, and you could actually rent the movies and get your own little video cassettes back in those days, you know, VHS, that sort of stuff. And then it, nowadays, of course, you just stream it on your phone. But back then, you could do all sorts of stuff. You know, you'd have to get these, these actual video cassettes. You could rent them. And later, they were cheap enough, you could buy them. But that was the death knell, and more and more of these horror hosts stopped, and eventually the whole phenomena disintegrated, and now there may be one or two left, or they found other ways, you know, they might be on cable television, or they might be on the internet in some ways uh, as horror hosts, but that whole idea sort of disappeared, and it became a thing of the past, which is why the house is set in the 1970s, in the uh, 1970s, near the end, of the horror host phenomenon. <clears throat> and uh, we had one here in, in, in Central Florida. It was Paul Bearer, interestingly enough, the same name that was going to be Cindy's father originally before they changed it up and made it uh, Albert Kane. So it's kind of interesting. It was an homage to the local horror host here in, in, in the Orlando area. But <clears throat> getting back to this, so they make the character actually resembled Paul Bearer in a way, H.R. Uh, Blood and Guts. And so the story here is that in Cary, Ohio, of course, uh, actually before that, there was a young man named Larry Kurtzberg who was an actor. And he was an actor on Broadway and had some really big hits for a while. Then his career suddenly tanked and he couldn't get cast anymore. And he became a has-been, oh, bad thing. So he went back home to Cary, Ohio. And the only job he could get as a thespian was not on the stage, not legitimate theatre, but he was forced to become a horror host for a local television uh, station, WKNB Channel 21. Ha ha! Cluing into the whole 21, right? I think, the, speaking of which, I think there might have been some playing cards in that caretaker shack in Winter Night, again, showing how those things kept popping up, cluing in. I don't think there were any in this one, but 
21, of course, was a clue uh, or a, a homage. And it's set in the 1970s, as I said. And so he was working there and became this character, H.R. Blood and Guts. And of course, H.R. Blood and Guts, the name itself, is a parody of an early 70s children's Saturday morning program by Sid and Marty Croft. He did all sorts of really surreal programs like Lidsville and the Bugaloos and the Lost Saucer and the Land of the Lost and all sorts of things. And one of the first ones was H.R. Puffin Stuff about a little British boy played by uh, the late uh, <clears throat> uh, Wild. His name was Wild. I forget his first name. Though. Was it Jack Wild? I think it was Jack Wild. He played Jimmy, <laughs> interesting name, and his magic golden flute, Freddy. And uh, they were kidnapped by Witchy Poo and, uh, on a boat, and they managed to escape to Living Island, where it Char Puff and stuff and all sorts of weird characters in these big suits, furry plush suits, would protect them from the evil witch and episode after episode. Very surreal, the sort of thing that you'd like to watch late at night in, the, in college fraternities when maybe you've had some uh, something. Uh, but uh, to, to make it more interesting or more laughable. But uh, Larry Kurtzberg, though, was working as HR Blood and Guts, and one day he's called into the office by John Reynolds in the late 70s and told, We will no longer require your services. This is a, the, the horror host thing is done. So your last time on television will be this Halloween a monster movie marathon that we're going to be doing uh, and it was themed to movies that were tied into to various holidays and that would be his last night as H.R. Blood and Guts and something in Larry's mind snapped and that's all the time I have for this video so I have to continue in part seven